My wife, Lorene, and I were married in Glen Ellen, Illinois in April of 1985. And then just two months later, we traveled to Bolivia, South America, uh, for a six-month experience as short-term missionaries. Uh, it was a brand new adventure in almost every way imaginable. Uh, new culture, new language, uh, ministry experiences, and even just laying the foundations for our married lives together. But the story I want to tell you now isn't about all that. I can tell you lots of stories about th those six months. But the story I want to tell you is uh, what happened when we were when time came for us to come home from those six months. Um, we went through the rather complicated process in that country of having our airline tickets uh, verified. You had to go to the airport and get those verified. Then you had to get an exit visa, pay a couple of officials uh, along the way to get that all done. Uh, and you need to know that in Bolivia at that time, like in many parts of the world, there were actually two ways to get legal stuff like that done. There was the proper legal way, and then there was the fast way to get it done. Uh, for example, when I went to get my driver's license, uh, I asked a Bolivian friend, hey, how do I get a driver's license? And he started taking me through all the steps to get it done the fast way. So you had to go here, pay that guy a little bit, pay this guy a little bit, pay that guy a little bit, and boom, you got your license. You could do it in one day. I said, well, what, what if we don't want to pay those tips? We would call them bribes in America. Well, what if I don't want to do that? What is, what's the legal way? And he thought for a minute, he said, I don't think you can do it that way, he said. Because <laughs> it literally would take weeks or months. So we get to the airport, we'd gone, went through the process again, another stamp on the ticket, another stamp on your passport, a few more tips paid to a few officials, and we finally were at the gate, the final gate to the flight that was going to take us home after six months living in a different culture. And at the top of the last escalator uh, to get to the gate, there was one more official looking guy standing there, uniform on, little hat, kind of waiting for us. So we get to the top and he says to me in Spanish, pasaporte, which meant he wanted to see my passport. So I took out my passport and handed it to him. Now. This, isn't, th this was an older passport. I just thought you would enjoy that picture. Check out that hair. That's quite the thing there. Actually, the passport I gave him was this one, okay, which is funny in its own way. So I handed him my passport, and he took my passport, and he flipped through it to the place where the stamp, the, the, the exit visa was stamped. And he took one look, and he said, su visa no es valido. In Spanish, it means your visa is not valid. I said, what do you mean, no, it's valido? It's got to be valido because I just did it yesterday. My sort of pigeon Spanish. And he said, no, no, it's valido. And I said, why, why, por qué? And he pointed to the stamp and the actual signature that we'd gotten the day before, and he said, uh, no trabaja todavía aquí. That means this man does not work here anymore. I said, what? It was yesterday. And I'm starting to get worked up now. And then it hit me. He was looking for just a little bit more. He wanted, he could tell we were Americans. It was quite obvious. He figured we had cash on us. And it was just one more thing. And I had kind of had enough culture at that point. I just didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to get on the plane. Plus, we'd already tipped like three other guys in the airport. And so I took my passport and I turned it to the very front like this. And I said, uh, look, see that? That says USA, United States of America, Americano. You know who El Presidente is? I said, El Presidente is Ronald Reagan. Ronaldo Reagano, mi amigo, I said. <laughs> I exaggerated just a little bit. But the funny thing was, the guy got kind of a wry smile on his face and he went, passe. <laughs> We're in a series right now called Wrestling with Jesus, and so far we've wrestled with Jesus about the kingdom, talk more about that today, wrestled about morality, and today we're going to wrestle with Jesus about politics. I figured I'd get that groan, <laughs> like, uh-oh, do we really have to talk about that? Well, well, yeah, we do, because Jesus talked about it. In fact, he talked about a lot of uncomfortable things. The next couple of weeks, we're going to wrestle with him about money and about sexuality. So today we get off easy just talking about politics, all right? Jesus talked about these things because he lived in a real world, in real history, in a real culture, with real questions and real pressures. And he wanted his followers to know 
then and throughout the centuries, that when these things collide, when these cultural human issues collide with his kingdom, he wanted us to know how to think and how to behave. So he talked about them. Now, before we even start, I want to um, clarify what we mean by the word politics. When we hear the word today in our culture, we hear partisan. We hear Republican. We hear Democrat or conservative or liberal. We hear attack ads. We hear negative campaigning and all that goes with that. But the word taken by itself simply means the way people living in groups make decisions. The way governments make rules and laws. Simply put, the way human beings live and work together. Now, a little background. We saw a couple of weeks ago that Jesus launched his public ministry by announcing the arrival of the kingdom of God. Mark tells us uh, that Jesus came proclaiming the gospel of God, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Luke tells us Jesus said the kingdom of God is in your midst, thus announcing that it was present in himself. And then he went around eating with tax collectors and sinful women, touching lepers, talked about loving your enemies, even healed the servant of a pagan Roman centurion. And all this created great upheaval, great controversy among the leaders of the Jewish religious and political community. They were asking, who does he think he is? Who does this guy think he is? Where does his authority come from? And by the time we pick up the story we're looking at today, we're right at the end of Jesus' earthly life. There's a strategy in place by his enemies to get rid of him, and what we're going to read is part of that. They're trying to trap him into saying something that will either get him arrested by the Romans or disqualify him from the crowds of uh, people that were following him. And here's the way the story goes. Matthew chapter 22, I'm going to begin in verse 15. Matthew writes, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Now let me pause there because I think there's something here uh, many of you uh, will not recognize right away. Uh, most of us have heard of the Pharisees. This was the, the very conservative uh, religious group, the experts in the law. They had positions of great power and influence in that culture. We know about them. But who were the the Herodians. What were they? Well, the Herodians were a group of Jews who openly supported the family of Herod the king. Now, Herod was a sort of a half-Jew who had been put in place by the Romans. He was uh, a Roman puppet king, supported the Roman Empire. And so, the Pharisees were on a completely different side of the political spectrum than the Herodians. They would have been enemies. The, the Pharisees would have considered the Herodians to be uh, unclean, unfaithful to God, even enemies of God. But notice here, they're joined together against Jesus. That should get our attention. That's, they were joined together by their hatred of what Jesus was doing. It'd be like today, in our culture, Republicans and Democrats joining together to do anything, right? <laughs> They're saying, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the thing that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. Now the political background of this story is significant. It has to do with the clash of two political systems. On the one hand, there was the Roman system. Uh, the Romans ruled that part of the world in those days. Their system was based on power and taxation. And there was the Jewish religious system, a system built on religious law and the temple. In the middle of all that mashup, Jesus comes announcing yet a different kingdom, the kingdom of God. A kingdom that's not built on power, wealth, and control, but a kingdom that's about repentance and the gospel. A kingdom built on love, sacrifice, and service. So that's the clash. And the first thing we see in this story is a loaded question. It begins with a loaded question. That's the first point today. I think we all know what a loaded question is. 
We see them every day in our lives. A loaded question is a question that's, that's impossible to answer correctly. For example, does this dress make me look frumpy? <laughs> does my mustache make me more handsome? Be careful. Do you still hate your boss? Questions like that. For example, in the recent hearings about the Supreme Court nominee, if you watched any of that, it was terribly frustrating to watch because every question asked of that nominee, but from either side of the aisle, was designed to elicit a response that was predetermined by the person asking the question. Every single question almost was a loaded question. And that's what's going on here. The Pharisees were like ancient religious lawyers, and they were armed with what they think is the perfect question to trap Jesus. Notice, Matthew says, then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And by the way, there are a number of attempts to do this in the New Testament. All of them turn out badly for the questioner, because they always underestimate Jesus, which many people still do today. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. You do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Notice, they start by pretending to respect Jesus. They're really out to get him, but they're pretending to respect him. They're flattering him, hoping he'll drop his guard and make a mistake. Verse 17, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So, what makes this a loaded question? A little historical background. The tax being talked about here was the Roman imperial tax. It was required of every single Jew living under the domain of Caesar. It was for the privilege of being Caesar's subject. It wasn't a lot of money. Uh, it was only about uh, one day's wages for a common laborer. Uh, but it was hated because it indicated to the Jews that they were subjugated to a pagan emperor. In fact, just 25 years earlier, historians tell us there was a man called Judas the Galilean who led an armed revolt of the Jews against the Romans over this tax. His message was, we have no God, no king, but God our king. We will not pay that tax to Caesar. And he led an armed revolt, cleansed the temple of all the pagan influences, and then ended up getting executed by the Roman Empire. Just 25 years earlier. So here comes Jesus preaching the kingdom of God is here. He's just cleansed the temple in the previous chapter, Matthew tells us, of the money changes and all that. And so his enemies come up with what they think is the perfect loaded question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Because the way the question is framed, Jesus can give no answer that's correct. There's no good answer. If he says yes, he's supporting a pagan emperor and, that, and, and clearly would have been against what most of the Jews felt and he would have denied the very kingdom he came to preach. If he says no, he's rebelling against Caesar and can be seen as a revolutionary like Judas the Galilean and will be crushed. It's a trap. But I want you to see something else here that I didn't see until this, this time when I was studying this. The question is also dishonest in a way because these questioners don't really care about the tax. They don't really care about the kingdom of God. What they care about is getting rid of Jesus. The question itself is what C.S. Lewis would call a red herring. That is a distraction. It's a distraction for the main issue because Jesus came preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. He says, repent and believe the good news. Jesus announced the kingdom of heaven itself was present in himself, and he would ultimately, we know, go to the cross as the final sacrifice for the sins of the world, and then rise from the dead to demonstrate the power of the gospel to give four news. New heart through the forgiveness of sin, New identity by being adopted into God's family. New purpose to serve in the kingdom of God. And new destiny to dwell and reign forever with him in the new heaven and new earth. This is what Peter called being born again into a living hope. That's what Jesus came to proclaim. But the Pharisees and the Herodians, what they want to know about is what he thinks about this tax. Presenting... This would be, this'd be like, uh, like me, someone like me, standing in front of a group, 
and presenting the central claim of the Christian faith. That is, Jesus died and risen again with the great hope of eternal life. You make that presentation as clearly as you can, and the person in the back of the class raises their hand and goes, oh, 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 what about the dinosaurs? <laughs> or what about evolution? Or do you really believe a man got swallowed by a fish? Or what about the Crusades? A zillion other questions they could ask about the Old Testament that might be interesting, it might have historical and, and archaeological answers, but they're not really the point. See, I think that's the primary way many people in our culture today deal with Jesus, which is why Explore God is so important. Research consistently shows that a vast majority of Americans believe that Jesus was a real historical person who really lived. Over 90% every time they survey. However, fewer and fewer people, especially people under 30, fewer and fewer believe that the gospel hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. To believe in Jesus without the resurrection completely misses the point. So, Jesus' enemies ask a loaded question, intended to discredit him before the Jews and incriminate him before the Romans. And to this question, Jesus gives what I'm calling a revolutionary answer. That's the second point today, a revolutionary answer. Years ago, um, we were sitting at dinner table one night. All four boys were young at that time, and one of the boys, maybe about six years old, just arrived at family dinner, uh, unannounced, uh, pipes up with a question. He says, uh, Dad or Daddy, are you the boss of our family? <laughs> I don't know what made him ask, but I always started to immediately think through my answer very carefully. And I mumbled through something like, well, I wouldn't use the word boss, but I believe God wants me to do my best to be a good leader, protect and provide for mom and you boys. And then that same boy was quiet for a minute. Then he said, okay, if you're the boss of our family, why do you always have to ask mom? <laughs> <laughs> I did not have a snappy answer for that one. Well, Jesus' adversaries often confronted him with questions designed to trip him up. Uh, and in each case, if you read through the New Testament, he offered a shrewd and even revolutionary answer. Let me give you a couple examples. At one point they asked him, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? You remember that question. They were hoping to get him to agree with their traditional views or to commit a heresy by making a mistake. And his answer was revolutionary. He says, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But he didn't stop there. He said, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That was revolutionary. Because they forever attached their vertical worship of God with how they love their neighbor. He was saying, you cannot love God without loving your neighbor. And if you do not love your neighbor, you cannot be loving God. That was revolutionary. And when they, they, then they ask him, well then, who is my neighbor? hoping Jesus would agree with their assumption that neighboring meant caring for those like you, other Jews. And what did he do? He told the story of the Good Samaritan, forever shattering their idea of an ethnically limited definition of neighbor. Here they ask, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It's a loaded question. But Jesus doesn't bite. Matthew says, but Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax, and they brought him a denarius. Now, notice here, Jesus did not have a denarius on him. He didn't have one. Uh, those accusing him of being, uh, uh, of, of being unlawful actually had one. I'll talk about that in just a second. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Now, a couple of interesting things here. The coin used to pay the tax was called a denarius. Can you put that image up here? There you go. Uh, and on, it was minted actually from, from silver that technically belonged to the Roman emperor. And then G when Jesus says, whose likeness and inscription is on it, I picture him holding up the coin because he asked for it, they gave it to him, he held it up. 
And on one side, go back to the image. Thank you. On one side, there was an image of Tiberius, who would have been the, the, the Roman emperor at that time, with the inscription that said, Tiberius, son of the god Augustus. If you flipped it over, he would have turned it around. There was another inscription on the back side that said, the emperor was Pontifex Maximus, which meant the chief priest of Roman polytheism. Therefore, this coin with the image of a pagan emperor claiming to be God and the high priest would have been highly offensive to the Jews. In fact, a Jew would not even have had one of the, a coin like this in his pocket ever. The Romans allowed them to make their own coinage for their common everyday life because they wouldn't even touch these coins if they could help it but they had to pay the tax with this coin. Now here's a point of interest. Jesus didn't have a denarius on him. When he asked for one, he's actually doing so to reveal the motives of his questioners. No Pharisee, the, the strictest keepers of the law of the time, would have dared have a coin like this in their pocket, especially not on the grounds of the holy temple where they were standing when this conversation happened. But at least one of them did because they produced one. The moment that happened, everybody watching would have gone, oh. So he didn't have one, but you did? You see, in their rabid determination to trap Jesus, they fell into his trap, which is why he said, you hypocrites. Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. What I want you to see here is that Jesus isn't avoiding the question. This isn't sort of a, a political, evasive, non-answer. What he's saying is, you're asking the wrong question. You're asking the wrong question. The question is not what belongs to Caesar. That's the easy part. The silver is his. The image on it is his image. Therefore, it belongs to him. The real question is, what belongs to God? Where is his image stamped? On you. On every human being created in the image of God. So what belongs to God? You do. Your life, your heart, your allegiance, your worship. And there's a subtle change in language here that we need to see. That we, it's hard to see in English. When the question is posed, the questioners say, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? The word they use is actually to give tribute to Caesar. It's a, it's a unique word. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar? When Jesus answers, he uses a different word. He says, give back to Caesar, using a word that means to return to, to render what is due. Jesus is saying, you've confused the two kingdoms. Human systems of government are necessary, and you are to give to Caesar what belongs to him. Laws and taxes are part of that, but you do not give to Caesar that which does not belong to him. You don't give Caesar everything he wants. He wants the tax, fine. He wants your heart, your ultimate allegiance, your worship, no. Do not give to Caesar that which belongs to God. We do not give to Caesar, that which belongs to God, because salvation, new heart, new identity, new purpose, and new destiny do not come from Caesar. They do not come from any kingdom or human government or human laws. Salvation is not found in overthrowing an oppressive regime. Salvation is found in the good news of the kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. The kingdom of, the, of this world, kings and emperors and governments, no matter how good, no matter how powerful, no matter how coercive, none of them change the heart. Only God can do that. And that leads us to the third point today, a greater hope. We see a loaded question, a revolutionary answer, and then a greater hope. As we all know, we are in election season right now. The ads just don't stop. TV, radio, and I don't, know about, I don't know about you, but it's just tiresome. And I really don't want to insult third graders, if they're any here, but the ads are, seem like they're written by third graders. You know, I've seen grade school kids nicer than that, right? But one thing they all have in common, no matter which side of the aisle they're on, no matter one thing they all have in common, they're selling hope. 
right? They're selling hope. Vote for me and I'll make your life better. Vote for me, I'll make you a little richer. I'll get you a better job. I'll forgive your student debts. Vote for me, I'll make the world a better place. They're selling hope. But Jesus doesn't say anything like that. He doesn't beg for votes. He just says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but give to God the things that are God's. And look at the reaction. Verse 22. When they heard it, they marveled. And the word for marveled there is an interesting word. It means amazed, astonished. In our common language today, we would say their minds were blown. Dumbfounded. And they left him and went away. These are the people trying to trap him. They're like, whoa. Nothing else to say. Mic drop. In one sentence, Jesus revolutionized the way they thought about Caesar, the way they thought about God, and the way they thought about themselves because he gave them a new way. Here's a curious thing. Jesus was a Jewish man living at a time when the Hebrew people were oppressed by one of the most bloodthirsty, brutal, and oppressive regimes in human history, the Roman Empire. And yet, he did not preach revolution. He did not. And yet he was a revolutionary. How, in what way? Because he brought a different kind of kingdom because he was a different kind of king. Tim Keller, pastor of New York City, writes that the kingdoms of this world, governments, authorities, are marked by a hunger for four things. He says power, success, comfort, and recognition. All kingdoms of this world are driven by the same four things. In fact, even when the oppressed or marginalized resist and revolt, what do they want? Power, success, comfort, and recognition. You hear it all the time. Take back your power. Take your power. Well, the kingdom of God is not about power. It's about love, servanthood, and sacrifice because our king came to love, serve, and sacrifice. So the issue is not getting rid of the kingdom of Caesar. The issue is welcoming the kingdom of God. So what do we owe or render to Caesar? Obedience to laws, pay your taxes, vote, participate. Obey the law, pay your taxes, vote, participate. In fact, the New Testament affirms all those responsibilities of followers of Christ multiple times. So what do we owe or render to God? Jesus said it this way, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. In his new book entitled Irresistible, Pastor Andy Stanley is wrestling with the issue of how the early followers of Jesus in the first century, people who they called the way, how did that survive? There's no way the early church should have survived with all the powers of Rome against it. Yet it did. It not only survived, but it changed the world. And he tells a story about how, uh, about the, the, the early practice in the first century of infanticide in the Roman Empire. That under the laws of Rome at that time, parents who did not want a child that was just born, whether because it was a girl or there was a defect or whatever, they would do something called exposure. They would just expose it. That means they would take it to a dumping ground, leave it, and let fates take care of it. it was totally legal, no punishment, wasn't against the law. But the early believers didn't see it that way. They thought every infant was born stamped by the image of God and therefore was of inestimable, eternal value. And these early Christians, followers of the way, followers of Jesus, would go to those dumping grounds, adopt those children, and at their own cost, and they had no money, they were persecuted, would raise them as their own. And in so doing, they changed the world. So what about our world? our political world? Should we be red or blue, right or left, Republican or Democrat? What does Jesus want us to do? What party does he want us to be a part of? Jesus would say, you're asking the wrong question. Wrong question. He would say, render to Caesar 
the things that are Caesar's. Pay your taxes, obey the laws, get involved. Get involved passionately with all the issues you care about. But just do this. When you do that, make sure you give to God what belongs to God. That is, live as those with new hearts, new identities, new purpose, and new destiny. Live as those who are citizens of a greater kingdom. Live as people with a greater love and a greater hope because you serve a greater king. That's what he'd say. He'd say, represent your king well. Represent your king well. Bow with me as I close. Lord God, I thank you for your wisdom in this beautiful little story. Thank you for teaching us what it means to live in your kingdom, what it means to follow and serve a king who loved and served us first. As your followers, may we be known not for our party, but for our compassion, our service, our generosity, and for our unwavering belief in the power of the gospel to transform people from the inside out. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.